So again, welcome to the Wednesday night small group. Our group is currently uh, doing a series of lessons on comparative world religions. So this is our Wednesday night small group. We're doing comparative world religions. And up to this point, we have looked at the religion of Judaism and Hinduism. And tonight we're going to look at Buddhism. So again, I just want to start by saying I'm not an expert on Buddhism just like I was not an expert on the first two. I have used several books to gain the information, and if you know of something that I have missed or something that I have wrongly stated, please feel free to correct it in the comment section of the videos. So, having said that, let's take a look at Buddhism. Buddhism is the world's fourth largest religion. Christianity is first, Islam is second, Hinduism is third, and Buddhism is fourth. Like Hinduism, there are a number of branches of Buddhism, and we'll come back to those here in a minute. Buddhism is similar to Hinduism, but there are some differences. Buddhists emphasize ethics and moral living over the ritual of Hinduism, and they totally reject the caste system of Hinduism. In Buddhism, all men and women have the possibility of attaining enlightenment. And that is the goal of Buddhism, is to obtain enlightenment. Uh, like Hinduism, Buddhism has the concepts of reincarnation and karma. Okay, uh, Just to refresh our memories on that, reincarnation means that as you go through life, you go through multiple lives, multiple stages of different lives. So that is the reincarnation. And where you reincarnate to, what level you reincarnate to, is based upon your karma, or the cause and effect of this life and your previous lives affect where you go in the next life. Unlike Hinduism, which teaches that the ultimate goal of one's life is to attain a oneness with their principal god, Brahman. For a Buddhist, the principal goal in life is to obtain, through reincarnation, um, nirvana. And nirvana is basically the ceasing of yourself as an individual and the joining of yourself with the universe in, if you will, non-existence. Um, Buddhism was initially founded as a reformation of Hinduism. As you can see, it's kept the reincarnation, it's kept the uh, karma, and it's kept some of the other ideas of Hinduism. It was intended to reform Hinduism because the founders saw lots of um, errors in his mind of what Hinduism taught. Today, there are between 325 million and 400 million followers of Buddhism. While most of them are found in Asia, Buddhists can be found throughout the world. So, who found Buddhism? Well, I found his name written in two different ways. The way that I normally have found it is the name Siddhartha Gautama, although I have found those names reversed. I have seen him listed as Gautama Siddhartha. I don't know which is right. The one I've found most often is the first one, Siddhartha Gautama. We do know that his name simply means Supreme Buddha or the Buddha or the Enlightened One because the goal of Buddhism is to attain enlightenment. And Buddhists see Gautama uh, Siddhartha as the one who first attained enlightenment. Again, there's a difference in when he was born. Most sources that I saw give his birth as around 560 BC, although there was one source that listed his birth at 620 BC. Not sure the birth makes a lot of difference on it, but somewhere around 600 BC, the guy who would become Buddha was born. He was born into a royal family. His parents were tribal leaders in what is today northeastern India or modern-day Nepal. 
Shortly after his birth, his mother died. And according to uh, Buddhist tradition, shortly after that, his family was visited by eight Hindu priests who prophesied that the new child would either be a great royal leader or a great spiritual leader. So his father wanted him to follow in his footsteps. He wanted him to be a great royal leader. So therefore, he kept the person who has become Buddha, he kept him pretty much in his palace compound for most of his life. During his life, um, he would be uh, married to a cousin. He would start a family. He would have a son. And he would never experience any of the suffering of his uh, followers, his royal followers, his uh, tribesmen out in the world. However, at age 29, he did in fact encounter poverty and suffering and death while he was on the uh, palace grounds. And he decided that this was not fair. There should be a way of ending suffering. I need to find out what the reason for suffering is and there must be a way of ending suffering. So he shaved his head, put on some robes and left his palace and began to wander the countryside as a beggar monk. Uh, after about six years of wandering and not finding an answer to his question, he sat down on the banks of the river Ganges under a tree and he sat there for 40 days and meditated. At the end of 40 days, he had been enlightened. He had come up with the answer to his question. What causes suffering and how do you end it? And from there, he would begin to teach his enlightenment to people who became his followers for the next 45 years until he died. Now, during his lifetime, his beliefs, his sayings were not recorded in writing. They were simply oral sayings. After his death, because of that, there were numerous branches or sects of Buddhism that formed around different aspects of his teaching. But eventually, there would be some written texts put down. And today, there are three sets of religious texts or religious writings that are unique to Buddhism. The first is called the Mahavastu, or translation, The Great Story. And The Great Story is basically the story of Gautama Siddhartha. It's the story of the Buddha. So it's his biography, if you will. It tells stories of what he did during his lifetime. The second set of uh, religious writings is called the Jataka Tales, which are 550 stories of Buddha's previous lives. Now, remember, Hinduism and Buddhism both believe in previous lives. They believe in reincarnation. So Buddha's previous lives, how they figured it out, I don't know. But they have stories in here about his previous lives before he became the Buddha. And the most important set of teachings, uh, religious writings about Buddhism, are found in what's called the Tripitaka, or the Three Baskets. So Three Baskets are three volumes, but these are the real teachings of Buddhism. So the first basket is called the Doctrine and the Discipline Basket, or the Disciple Basket, excuse me, the Doctrine and Disciple Basket. And these are a collection of rules and regulations that tell the Buddhist monks and nuns how they should live together. Now, most of their life is spent wandering as beggars. But in the monsoon season, they have to hold up in a monastery somewhere. So these are rules about how you live together in a monastic life if you're a Buddhist monk or nun. Okay? The second basket is called the teaching basket. And I guess for me, this is kind of the core beliefs of Buddhism. It is the discourses or the writings or sayings of Buddha himself. And there are over 10,000 of these. 
all the things from little short pithy sayings up to long sermons, if you will. And the third basket is called the metaphysical basket. And what those are are basically commentaries on the first two. They are exclamations, uh, discourses on what the doctrine and discipline or disciple basket is and what the teaching basket. It's explaining it to those people who are not enlightened yet, which is most of the world. Okay, and then finally, I said there were many different sects of Buddhism. Well, because of that, each sect may have its own unique religious writings. So, for instance, Tibetan Buddhism, which is headed by the Dalai Lama, has a unique religious writing called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So that gets entered into the other religious writings. Okay, So what does Buddhism have to say about God? Well, basically it's, there's no God. There's no need for a supreme being. So Buddhists don't believe in a supreme being. A Buddhist reaches self-enlightenment by virtue, virtue of his karma and his continual progression through various reincarnations, and eventually he will get there. So it's his personal responsibility to get his salvation, if you will, his enlightenment. So therefore, there's no need to have a God. Uh, some Buddhists believe that Buddha was actually an avatar of a guard, God who then came to earth. But as far as a belief in a personal creator God, Buddhists say, nope, don't need one. So what about Jesus? Well, they acknowledge that Jesus existed. He was an historical person, but they look at his life in the uh, context of the teachings of Buddhism. So if you're a Buddhist in the Western world, and there are Buddhists in the Western world, in Europe and North America, they see Jesus as an enlightened teacher. Okay? Similar to Hinduism. Hinduism also acknowledges Jesus as an enlightened teacher. If you're an Eastern Buddhist, then many of them think that Jesus was, again, an avatar of a god. Similar to Hinduism. Neither of them view Jesus as God. He was a, an enlightened man. He was an avatar of God. He was not God himself. We don't need God. It's our way of getting to heaven. Some branches of, Hind of uh, Buddhism actually teach, and again, similar to Hinduism, that Jesus traveled to the east, Excuse me just a minute. <coughs> Some Buddhists believe that Jesus, like Hinduism, traveled to the East and actually studied Buddhism from the age of 12 to 30. And when he went back at age 30 and began his ministry, he was actually spreading Buddhism to the Jewish and Roman cultures in which he lived. Again, think big to Hinduism. Hinduism has the same idea. Jesus studied Hinduism, not Buddhism, but in both cases, he went back to the Middle East to spread that religion. They do acknowledge his death. Like I said, they acknowledge he was a historical person, but they do not believe that he rose for the dead. And a very good reason for that. Remember, Buddhism, like Hinduism, thinks of reincarnation. So you die and you're reincarnated as another person. So you don't rise from the dead. You're reincarnated. So they would deny that Jesus ever was reincarnated. Excuse me, that Jesus was ever raised from the dead in his physical body. Maybe he was reincarnated. They don't say who that was, but did not rise from the dead in his physical body. Holy Spirit, no such thing. Don't believe in it. They do believe in spirits and ghosts, but they do not believe in a Holy Spirit as Christianity would define it. So again, how about salvation? Well, I said earlier that for a Buddhist, the responsibility of your enlightenment, and enlightenment is salvation, is the individual's responsibility. 
And to reach salvation, you must go through a number of iterations, reincarnations, going to different levels of um, enlightenment until such time as you reach the ultimate level of enlightenment. And your reincarnation is based on karma. So what did you do in this life affects what goes on in the next life. What you did in previous lives affected this life. So again, this idea of reincarnation means, like a Hindu, a Buddhist has a great sense of personal responsibility about how he lives his life because the longer it takes him to reach enlightenment, the longer he has to be reincarnated. Ultimately, though, an individual will reach nirvana. And nirvana is the elimination of all your desires, cravings, and suffering. It's basically non-existent. It's not like a Hindu. You're not going to be united with Brahma. You're going to be united with non-existence. Nothing. Okay. So how about death in the afterlife? Again, Buddhism talks about reincarnation. And like Hinduism, it talks about multiple layers of heaven and hell. Again, similar to Hinduism, it talks about these are way stations while you await reincarnation. So if you've been a good person in this life and in previous lives, you go to a level of heaven that's okay. It's a level where you can restfully wait until you're reincarnated at a higher level again. If you were not a good Buddhist, if you were not a good person in this life, then you may go to a lower he level of heaven or a lower level of hell. But again, it's a um, transition point. It's a place where you're waiting until you're reincarnated again. And it depends on where you're reincarnated, what your life is going to be. What was your karma like? But unlike Hinduism, Buddhists believe that you can experience heaven and hell actually on earth. So you can have a really great life, and that's heaven. Or you can have a really poor life, and that may be an experience like hell. Take your pick. But again, eventually the ultimate goal of a Buddhist is not heaven. It's nirvana, nothingness a ceasing to exist as an individual and you're part of the greater whole of the universe. So, major teachings of Buddhism. Well, there are really, I guess I would say, three major teachings of Buddhism. The first is what's called the modern middle, excuse me, the middle way. The second is called the Four Noble Truths. And the third is called the Eightfold Path. So let's start with the middle way, okay? When Sahata Gautama, or Buddha, left his family, began wandering as a wandering beggar, he was looking for the cause of suffering. And he decided that the cause of suffering was mankind's desires and cravings. And in Hinduism, he saw that there was extreme self-denial and other Hindus had extreme luxury, had extreme um, hedonism. They were living the life of Riley, if you will. Those of you that know what that means. Um, so he said, there has to be a middle way. There has to be a way of moderation. Not extreme denial, not extreme luxury. There is a middle way to um, enlightenment, to dharma. If you remember from Hinduism, Dharma is the way of righteousness or the way of enlightenment. So both Hindus and Buddhists preach Dharma. For a Buddhist, the way to get to enlightenment is through moderation, the middle way. So second major belief is called the Four Noble Truths. And it kind of revolves around this idea of the middle way. So the first noble truth is there's suffering in the world. And it's universal. Everybody suffers, some to more extent than others. Okay? The second noble truth 
is that the cause of suffering is selfish desire, cravings, and attachment to this world. So you've got to detach yourself from this world. Again, remember the ultimate goal of a Buddhist is to be totally separated from the world, to be in non-existence. Okay? So the third noble truth of Buddhism is that the cure for suffering, remember, suffering is universal. The reason for suffering is our desires and attachment to the world. The third noble truth is eventually sur suffering is going to end. And it ends when we eliminate our desires and attachment to this world. And how do you do it? The fourth noble truth, you have to follow the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is basically the guidelines of how a Buddhist must live his life. So the Eightfold Path goes like this. Number one, reality is not the same as it appears. So what you're seeing around you for reality, it's an illusion. Reality is not the same as it appears. The second is you have to change your individual thinking to reflect a proper understanding of what reality is. So what you see is not reality. Secondly, you got to get a proper understanding of reality to make a, a effort to get to enlightenment. So how do you do that? Number three, you speak truthfully, kindly, and humbly. Number four, you behave in ways that do not harm others. Number five, you work without harming others. Number six, you make physical self-improvement. So speak truthfully, kindly, humbly. Your behavior should not harm others. Your, what you do for your work should not harm others. You must make physical self-improvement. And on top of that, you need to, number seven, practice mindfulness, which is meditation, which is number eight. You need to sit and meditate on what the Buddha has said. This is what's going to help you to progress to enlightenment. You need to meditate and talk about and think about what the Buddha has done and said and what his followers, excuse me, have said after him. So having said that, there are three major branches of Buddhism. And they take different approaches to those uh, middle way, um, noble truths, and eightfold path. So the first branch of Buddhism is called the Theravada. Uh, this is the branch where only the monks can achieve self-enlightenment. So again, Buddhists believe in reincarnation. They're going to move up the ladder, if you will, in the pecking order. And eventually, the top of the pecking order are the monks. And when you get up there, at that point, you have an opportunity to make it to self-enlightenment. You have to wait until you get to be a monk to be self-enlightened. This branch is dominant in the countries of Sri Lanka, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. So basically Southeast Asia. These are what I call the conservatives of Buddhism. Okay, The second branch of Buddhism is the Mahayana. And under this branch, you don't have to wait to be a monk. You can be reincarnated, or excuse me, you can reach self um, enlightenment right now in this present incarnation. And I call these the liberals of Buddhism. Everybody can make it. You don't got to be a monk. This branch is dominant in the areas of Nepal, China, Tibet, Japan, Vietnam, and Korea. So kind of Southern Asia and Far East Asia, not the little area down Southeast Asia. So different areas. And the third type of major type of Buddhism is called Tantrism. 
And this is actually a combination of the second one, the Mahayana Buddhism, with occult practices in Tibet. So this is what we would call Tibetan Buddhism. It's the official uh, religion of Tibet, and it's also found in Nepal. And the Dalai Lama is the spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism. He is an enlightened, according to a Tibetan Buddha, Buddhist, he is an enlightened individual. He has reached enlightenment, and he has come back to teach, to bring others to enlightenment. Buddhism is very tolerant of other religions. Remember their beliefs about Jesus? They take Jesus and incorporated him into their religion. Um, they'll embrace aspects of other religions. They're very tolerant of other religions. But they kind of give it a bend to their beliefs, to Buddhism. A Buddhist will engage in daily worship. They don't have a specific day of the week that they gather together as a group to worship. They have daily meditations. And during those meditations, they will meditate on sayings of the Buddha and they will chant sayings of the Buddha. These are ways that they expect to eventually reach self-enlightenment by meditating and chanting these things. Um, but they also have temples. And again, like Hindus, Hindus worship at home. They also worship in temples. But like Hindus, Buddhists, when they worship in temples, worship individually. They're there with the group, but they're worshiping, they're chanting, they're meditating on their own. They're not part of a communal, communal worship service. And two, last little bits of information about Buddhists. Like Hindus, Buddhists will offer food, will put out food offerings as part of their worship. But unlike Hindus, if you remember we talked about Hindus, uh, Hinduism, they put out food for the spirit of the God who's come down to their icon as they would a host. They were hosting the spirit of their God. For a Buddhist, they put out food offerings so that will appease the hungry ghosts or spirits so that those ghosts or spirits will not cause them bad effects. So it's more appeasing the spirit world than it is in worship. The last little thing that you th may associate with Buddhists is the lotus flower. The lotus flower is a very significant religious symbol for Buddhism. For them, the lotus flower represents the awakening or the enlightenment of an individual to spiritual purity. If you've ever seen a lotus flower, it opens up broadly so they receive enlightenment. So the lotus flower is a symbol of an individual's enlightenment. Okay, so that's all I have on Buddhism today. And again, I encourage you to uh, listen to this. If you see something that you have a question about, or if you see something that I've gotten wrong and you know information that I didn't find, please put it as a comment on the um, comment section of the video and I will try to find an answer to your question or I will be glad to have a correction if somebody knows something else. As I've said before, I'm not the expert here. I'm simply relaying what I have learned. So let's close with prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and study the religion of Buddhism. It's a religion and a way of life that millions of people across the world follow. And we know that it's not the way to you. We pray that with the knowledge that we gain through these studies of different religions, we'll be better able to address the questions of those who follow that religion and bring them to a closer understanding and a belief in you as the true God. Go with us now as we finish our week. May we have a safe week and be together again on Sunday as we worship virtually. For we ask it in your name. Amen.